Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CGA show. Today we're going to learn all about millennials and we are talking about Not Everyone Gets a Trophy written by Bruce Tolgan who has been studying Gen X initially and now you're studying millennials. So tell me, how did it start? So welcome Bruce, first of all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Yeah, well, you know, Rainmaker Thinking, we're in New Haven, Connecticut mm -hmm. and we've been studying young people in the workplace since 1993. And uh, so my first book was Managing Generation X, came out in 1995. Mm -hmm. And uh, once, uh, you know, I'm a Gen Xer, I'm almost 50. Yeah. So uh, once uh, the millennials started coming into the workplace, uh, we turned our focus to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been trying to keep our finger on the pulse of the new young workforce for, for decades now. So in fact, when we first started looking at millennials, we were looking at the first wave millennials, mm. the folks born 1978 to 1989. Now the, the second wave millennials are the ones coming into the workplace, those born 1990 and later. Mm -hmm. We call them second wave millennials. The second, oh, so there's even a differentiate. And why do you make the differentiation between the two? Well, because if you look at those born 1978 to 2000, mm -hmm. then, you know, 16 year olds are in the same generation as 38 year olds. And that just it didn't seem right. And uh, the research shows that there's a pretty big break uh, once you have those born 1990 and later. You know, if you think about it, the first wave millennials grew up in the 90s. Everything was great in the 90s. Right. Then they came into the workplace in the 2000s. Things weren't so good. Right. Uh, the, the second wave millennials, um, you know, they may have been little children in the 90s, but they sort of came of age uh, during the economic uh, uncertainty and right. war and terrorism and all that stuff of the 2000s. So there's really a different mindset. Mm. And what kind of research are you doing? It sounds like the Rainmaker Group has been doing. Is it um, market research? Like, what kind of market research are you doing? You is it anecdotal? Are you talking to people? Are you doing massive studies? What kind of research are you doing? Yeah, well, now it's a 23-year-long longitudinal study. Uh, we don't look at market-based data. What we do is we only look at workplace data. Mm. So we interview people in the workplace, and we interview their managers. Oh, fun. so. For, for yeah, so for 23 years, we've been interviewing young workers, and we interview their managers. And uh, so all of our work is based on these in-depth interviews. We also do focus groups and, and polls. We also look at the internal survey data that our clients provide for us. And we look at publicly available data. But more than 300,000 individuals have participated in our research over the last 23 years, 400 different companies. And... Uh, in the individual interviews, you know, we do in-depth interviews. So tens of thousands of people wow. we've been interviewing, you know, we've been interviewing tens of thousands of them for decades. So wow. we go back to them. So some of the Gen Xers we've been interviewing for 23 years. Wow. And now they're managing millennials. Okay. So, so you, you're, you, you have these two millennial groups. Is there a big difference between those two millennial groups? I know you said that there's uh, in the macro macro level things were, were very very different what was happening in our economy what the you know the environment that they're facing at work so how what's the difference between the two millennial groups well in some ways it's a continuation of trends right uh -huh. so global globalization technology institutions in a state of constant flux individuals rediscovering uh, self-reliance the information tidal wave, the pace of change. Right. You know, a lot of this stuff has just been accelerating over time. But there have been some fundamental changes, right? The the, the magical economy of the 90s turned into the never-ending disaster of the economy right. over the last 10 years or so. Um, uh, peace at, at the end of the Soviet Union was the dominant international story in the 90s. You know, by the 2000s, it was terrorism and war. Mm. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the, the sort of self-esteem-based parenting of the 90s turned into the helicopter parenting of the 2000s. <laughs> you know, so, right? So the yes. second wave millennials, they're raised by helicopter parents on steroids. And also remember that in the 90s, the Internet was emerging, right? But by the 2000s, uh, and especially the late, uh, latter 2000s, um, the handheld supercomputers are permanently attached to everybody's brain. Right. So, uh, the, you know, the biggest changes are uh, are those. And 
But in many ways, you can see that this is uh, like all generational stories. It's a it, it's the accidents of history. Right. Right. All right. So I have um, I, I I'm now actually in a group right now and I'm, I'm looking at my questions because I have I'm working with a bunch of people from HR from corporations who I know you're surveying. And so they actually talk about things in a corporate HR term. So they talk about recruiting. This is from the perspective of maybe um, a a millennials manager. They talk about recruiting. They talk about onboarding. They talk about engagement. These are the buzzwords that are, that are like, like literally happening at this moment in the meeting around the corner for me. And so there are a whole bunch of HR folks talking about that and they're completely they're 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 completely confused they don't know what to do with millennials because a lot of the old things that they used to do did not aren't working anymore and they don't know what to try instead and in your book you talk about a whole bunch of different things and i thought we could actually just use every single thing you know from recruiting to onboarding to engaging and managing and using that as a model because companies are very, very confused. So what are you finding when you talk to companies and what's working and what's not working? Let's just start from the very beginning from recruiting. Yeah, well, when it comes to recruiting, a a lot of organizations, even though uh, so much has changed in the employer-employee relationship, a lot of employers are still trying to recruit people by saying, you know, come join the family, pay your dues, climb the ladder, in the long run, the system will take care of you. Here are all the long-term vesting rewards we have to offer you. You know, most young people, when they hear that, it goes in one ear and out the other. Right. And, and, and best case scenario, they can use that recruiting message to compare you to other employers, maybe, because so many employers are still speaking that language. Right. Uh, but what, what we find in our research is most young people, uh, no hard feelings, but they look at your company from the outside, they're not really asking themselves, hey, I wonder where I fit in your big picture. What they're really thinking is, I wonder where your job might fit in my life story. (laughs) (laughs) That's a huge difference. Right. right? Wow. That's fascinating. So, you know, they're trying to look, especially in the early stages of their careers. And part of this is just about being young, but, but but it's also about being young at a time when the fundamental employer-employee bargain has changed. Job security is dead. People don't think in terms of going to work in one organization, pay your dues, climb the ladder, stay there for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And of course, not everyone did that in the past, but that was sort of the default presumption of success. Right, yes. And and, and nowadays, the most success-minded people, you know, especially young people, that's just not how they think. So uh, when they're looking at your employment opportunity, they're much more likely to be thinking short term and transactional. What do you want from me today, tomorrow and this week, this month, this year? What do you have to offer me today, tomorrow, this, this week, this month, this year? <laughs> wow. right? Okay. That's and, like, and, I also have this image of being in the market in Turkey, you know, where you're going and you're walking in and you're like, what's, you know, you know, what do you have? I have figs and, you know, and like, do I want figs right now? Do I not want figs? Like what it's, it is truly transitional, transactional and in the moment. And what yeah. I heard you say is that, you know, the story that I heard when I was going to work, I'm 52, 53. I don't remember how old I'm, I'm, I'm old. Okay. Well, 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 well you were very, very well. Okay. Thanks. So, so the kind of the story that I was getting is, okay, join the corporation, you know, we'll take care of you. Like all the different things that play the game. And so millennials, they, a lot of companies are still playing that message. Join us, play the game, you know, if you play your cards right, you may get promoted. And millennials are like, what? I like, what are you doing for me at this very moment? <laughs> like, how much are you going to pay me? Is the job interesting to me at this moment, at this present moment? So it's a huge difference in terms of the recruiting yeah, and, message. And it's sort of a no hard, hard feelings thing because, right. look, you know, uh, this is just the way things are. There's so much uncertainty. Organizations have to be lean and flexible. Um, some still try to promise long-term job security and long-term vesting rewards. But, you know, what younger, less experienced people say is uh, when, when, when companies say, here's what you can get in 10 years, here's what you can get in 15 years, most young people think, oh, silly grown-ups. <laughs> don't, be, right? 
D- don't you realize how uncertain the world exactly. is? Exactly. You, really you haven't really been living in this century, have you? Because <laughs> if you had, you right. would have known anything could happen at any moment. All right, so the kind of things, if I were to talk to millennials, and I like some of the ideas that you have in your book, it's like, hey, you can have a flexible work schedule. You can work from home. Um, we're going to try to give you something. Like, what are some of the things that you would want to say? So if this old story is kind of like, I totally don't care. So you're telling me about your whatever your ancient history is not interesting to me. So what would I say to a millennial? If I were to talk to a millennial today and I wanted them to come, what would I have to say to get them to be interested in what I have selling in my market today? Right, right. Well, you have to look at the transactional uh, deal and you have to figure out what what do you want from people and what do you have to offer? Mm -hmm. So what most employers want from people is they want them to do lots of work very well, very fast, all day long with a big smile on their face. Right. And and get paid very little until you get up to the big league. Right. Right. Well, what most employers want to do that at the lowest cost they can get away with. Right. Right. So, so what most employees want, and young people are no different, is they, they want money and they want as much as they can get. And by the way, they want, uh, if they're high performers, they want control over their rewards. So low performers want to be treated like everyone else. Right. High performers, you know, if they work hard, if they work fast, if they work smart, they want to be able to earn more. Yeah. So don't believe anyone who says they don't care about money. They care about money. Right. Right. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, it's just like lava. And in fact, you, like, oh, want yeah, some, yeah. you want someone who wants to says, do you have performance-based compensation? Because that means they know that they're going to work their tail off, but they're not going to unless you reward them, right? So in some ways, That's exactly right. in the old model, you would say, oh, you greedy little bastard. You know, why do you, why do you want that money now? Like, you have to prove it to me. But in some ways, if you're transactional, like, I'll work really hard for you, but you have to you have to guarantee me that if I do, I get something out of it, right? It's a very different mindset. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so what a lot of young people, if you tell them, you know, here's what you get in a year, here's what you get in three years, here's what you get in five years, they kind of think to themselves, well, but what if I am really, really valuable? Now, if they don't think that, you know, maybe you should have second thoughts because they might just be coming to hide out and collect a paycheck and figure out what they really want to do. Oh, right. right. So it, because they're young. Right? right. So if you get somebody who's really into it, you want someone who wants right. to know, hey, what do I need to do to earn more? So that's the money piece. Beyond that, what they want is more control over their own schedule, but they don't need that on a silver platter. They want to know, hey, what do I need to do to earn more? Right. Like you don't just have to seed seed flexibility without some type of I mean, there's still in the transactional model when you're in Turkey selling plums and (laughs) and figs, you're still having some type of exchange, right? Exchange of value. I'm going to pay you something. So the question is, what do I need to do in order to get flexibility? Is that right? I mean, as a manager, you have to think that way, right? Right. Like like a lot of managers will say to me, oh, these young people, they come in and they say, hey, listen, now, let me just be clear. I don't think I can work on Thursdays. Right. And the manager doesn't know what to do with that. Right. I always tell managers what you say to that is, oh, yeah, here's what I need from you every Wednesday at midnight. Right. You <laughs> deliver that for me by Wednesday at midnight. I don't need to see you on Thursday. Otherwise, right. I'll see you Thursday. Right. So so the, the number one thing other than money that they care about is more control over their own schedule. The number two thing other than money that they care about is relationships at work. Who are they going to be working with? Who are they going to be dealing with? Now, some young people, the answer they're looking for is, you don't have to deal with anyone. <laughs> we're, going to leave, right? we're going to leave you alone. Right? But, you know, some young people, they want to know, hey, am I going to be working with my friends? You know, are we right. going to be able to pal around? Again, that cuts both ways. Sometimes that's not what you want in an employee. You know, in the retail sector, we call that cash register culture, where their friends at the cash register are more important to them than the customer. You've got to be very careful about that. Uh, And what I always tell leaders is, you know, what you want is to create an environment where, yeah, the relationships matter. And the most important relationships are with the customer, with the client, with the immediate leader, manager, supervisor. And then their their relationships with their colleagues are like, like a team of high performers. You know, like the Marines, right. you know, their their relationships are very important to right. one another. But it's because they're very mission driven and they, they lift each other up. They make each other better. They hold each other to a high standard. So relationships at work are very important to young people. Right. But you got to play that right. 
Right. right. And this is so interesting because what I've, you know, when I'm talking to some of my friends are like, I don't even know what to tell them. Like they say, I don't, I can't, like we have a big report that we have to deliver on Friday. And they're like, yeah, but I have my Pilates class on Friday. It's like, right. and then some, my older friends are like, yeah, don't go to the Pilates class. <laughs> like it seems like right. a pretty easy equation. But in some ways, what I'm hearing you say is it's a negotiation. It's more like, I understand you want to go to your Pilates class. So what are you going to do on Thursday night so that you can make the Pilates class? As long as you deliver that report on Friday, I'm fine. And if you don't deliver the report, I'm going to be unhappy because what that means is I feel like I can't rely on you when it's really important. And that's not going to reflect well when it comes to paying you later or like whatever. So you giving them consequences. That's exactly- that's- that's exactly right. It's it's a, and you you hit the nail on the head. It's an ongoing negotiation, right? And this is true of every aspect of the transaction, right? So, and every uh, moment, that's, right? That's, like every single right. moment. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a reason why I I call the millennials the most high maintenance generation in the history of the workplace. Uh, now they they're probably going to be the most high performing uh, generation in the history of the workplace. But they are high maintenance. Right. And uh, if you want high performance, you have to commit to high maintenance. And it's precisely because of that ongoing negotiation is a big part of it. By the way, so it's so it's money, more control over their own schedule, relationships at work. The third thing other than money they care about is task choice. So they'll hmm. do a bunch of grunt work. You tell them, hey, you got to go dig a ditch. Right. right. OK, but then you better pay more. You better give them more control over their own schedule. Oh. And they're going to say to you, hey, you know. After I dig that ditch, you know, then what do I do? And is it, dig another ditch, right? So at some point, right, at some point, they want to know, like, how do I get a more interesting task? Right. And, and that's something they really care about. Right. And they'll dig 100 ditches if you make it clear that step one, dig 100 ditches. Right. Step two, then we're going to give you a more interesting task. Right. And that's the third thing other than money that they care about. The fourth thing is learning opportunities. The fifth thing is location and workspace. So location might mean, you know, I want to work in Cleveland right. or probably not. But, um, you know, <laughs> Who wants to work in Cleveland? No offense, Cleveland people. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, let's face it. Right. But, uh, or, you know, I don't want to work on this side of the building. Right. I want to work on that side of the building. Right. Or, hey, if I have to work here in this cubicle, I bring my dog to work. Yeah. You know, so, so, so it's, those are the, so when I try to help my clients build a recruiting message, the first thing I do is say, you know, you got to create two sides of the ledger. Mm -hmm. The first side of the ledger is what do you need them to do? Day one, week one, month one, year one. What is it that looks like success for them? If they're Mm -hmm. just hitting home runs every day, what does that look like? And then on the other side of the ledger, it's money, uh, schedule, relationships, task choice, learning opportunities, and location. And the real key is trying to, to plug into their short-term transactional thinking and help them on an ongoing basis, uh, help, help them by negotiating with them and helping them see Here's what you need to do to earn more of the things you need. Right. And I think that that this is, yeah, that's the biggest mistake because we just feel like, I guess we'll just give it to them because I don't know, like, what will it take? And we're not, I think as managers, we're not used to having a dialogue with our employees and having this transactional bargaining. So I think that that's, and oftentimes what I've noticed that people my age do is they just cede control. They're like, okay. Well, I guess, okay. Like, I, I don't even know what to say because they're not used. Right. They actually even don't have a role model with their supervisor on how to manage that conversation because it's never happened because the power and authority of the manager was whatever went, was said. So they exactly. I, that's why I think people my, uh, at my level or or below, they they literally don't know how to have the conversation because they have, it's almost like they didn't have role modeling on how to do it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, uh, one of our interviewees told us this great story where, you know, uh, his manager kept saying, hey, you got to come in earlier, you got to stay later, you got to go the extra mile. And this young fellow kept saying, what do I get? Right. And and they kept saying, well, wh- what do you mean you get to you get to keep working? Right. <laughs> right? right. And, and, and finally, this young fellow said, no, no, no. But I mean, if I really do all the stuff you're saying and really go the extra mile, what do I get? 
And then the manager said, oh, well, you know, in five years, you could be here. In 10 years, you yeah, could be like, here. Pow. Could be here. <laughs> right. This young fellow said, I felt like they were, what's that expression, trying to sell me a bridge? Yeah. Yeah. And we just, and then people in my generation just like, okay, like, cause we expected to be there five years later and we were okay with that equation. Cause it was the equation. It's the Kool-Aid that everyone was drinking. Whereas right. in some ways I think that these millennials are more enlightened. They're like, wait a second. Like you're not going to like, you know, that, that, that message doesn't work with me. So you basically want to be, be di- you know, doing grunt labor, digging a hundred ditches and what are you doing doing this the whole time oh you're sipping pina, <laughs> pina coladas like that doesn't sound like a good deal for me so i get that in terms of recruiting and then i'd assuming like the other things that i read in your book about onboarding were and i've heard this before a person i talked to said you know this one company did a fabulous job recruiting and onboarding she was completely pumped up and then they could not deliver after like a couple months, she was like, what happened to all the glory and, you know, the celebration? Now I'm just like one of you slugs sitting here working and she just did not. She left after a year. So what's happening with the onboarding stuff from the millennial perspective? Yeah, I mean, and, and, and you're right. Sometimes companies put so much effort mm-hmm. into onboarding. Probably the best example of this is when you have interns. Right. And you're really so it's still part of the recruiting process. Right. And, you know, but, hey, we're going to take you to lunch. Right. You know, when you baseball do games. Like, yeah. Right. Right. We're going to give you gold stars. You get to go to the baseball game. Then you start the real job and they send you down to a deep, dark basement to go through <laughs> boxes and boxes of documents. <laughs> and say, hey, when do I get to go to the baseball game? Oh, no, that's just for intern. Right. right. <laughs> Exactly. Oh. That was just to hook you. But now that you're here, go back to the basement and look through all those documents. And I think that that, yeah. so what does that mean? So those people who have that, to me, in some ways, it feels like um, false advertising, right? Like, Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's a great term. And that's what a lot of young people say is, gee, you know, uh, I want, tell me what you really want from me. Tell me what you really have to offer me. And, and, uh, let's be transparent. And, um, but in onboarding, you know, my view is that what the biggest mistake is that employers, they, they put a bunch of effort into the recruiting process, right. especially if you're hiring people in the STEM field, right? Right. Because they're in great demand and they're in, not in great supply. And so we go to great efforts to recruit these young people. And then what happens is uh, they walk in the door. Maybe you have an orientation program. Uh, but at some point, what happens is um, then you put them in a sink or swim environment. Mm. And what we've learned is that whenever you put them in a sink or swim environment, that's when you're in danger of, of starting to lose. Mm. So uh, my gold standard for onboarding is mer- the Marines boot camp. Yeah. You know, because they're strong. They're highly engaged. Uh, you know, they, 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 they build connection to the organization. They build connection to the mission. They build connections to the leaders. They build, uh, you know, they teach you a whole lot of stuff about how to conduct yourself. And it's a shared experience. Mm. So obviously most organizations don't have the resources to create a 13-week, 24-hour-a-day uh, program. And most organizations don't have a critical mass of new hires starting all at once. Right. But what I always tell employers is when somebody joins your organization, You've got to focus on them, grab a hold of them, uh, make sure they're not spending time alone, you know, uh, uh, get them up to speed uh, and on board uh, systematically, rigorously. Um, and, 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 and the question is, when do you let them go? My answer is whenever you want to lose them, mm. right? Uh, you know, think about the Marines. They have a 13-week onboarding program. Uh, they call it boot camp. Right. And, That's a long uh, three yeah. months of just so there. Are, so 13 weeks, those Marines are just in a group together learning the ropes. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And they, you know, they tear them apart and they rebuild them, basically. You know, oh. they, they, they take an ordinary human being and they, they tear them apart and they and they turn that and then they build them up from the ground up. They teach them how to do everything. Right? <laughs> And, and, um, and they, they, they turn an ordinary human being into a United States Marine, no small thing, right? 
But but think of this. Even after 13 weeks, they do not give those young Marines a gun and say, go get the bad guy. Right. Right. That's not what happens. Mm -hmm. You know, then they send them to infantry school. After that, they don't say, here's a gun. Go get the bad guys. They put them in a fire team of three Marines with a fire team leader who's with them, providing guidance, direction, support Mm. and coaching every step of the way. You know, when do they let them go? The answer is never. Right. And. Uh, so my view is that uh, and what we see in our research is the biggest mistake you can make is thinking they want to be left alone. Mm. They do not want to be left alone. Right. Uh, they, they want someone to to uh, help them make a connection to the organization, to the mission, to their immediate team, to their immediate leaders. Uh, they want someone to set them up for success. Remember. Uh, uh, this is the the millennials. Nobody's ever left them alone for a minute. Right, they've never. They've right. always been connected. They're connected That's to their right. friends at three in the morning when they're texting each other, or you know, exactly they're connected right. to um, their parents who are texting them every two seconds. Like they're always connected. They're never alone. So, what's interesting right. about this, and and what you, what I love the ideas in your book. You have a bunch of different strategies, and and you talk about the um, you know the onboarding for the military and. And, and I, I've only seen movies, so I don't have a, as enough experience as you do in onboarding. But, you know, at the very beginning, they tell you how to dress, how to wear your hair. Like, they tell you what the cultural norms are of that organization. This is what success exactly looks like. Right. This is what success doesn't look like. And I, I assume based on the movies, they punish you, right? So I don't, I wouldn't recommend that, that in corporations. But they, they're very clear with the consequences, how to dress, how to get something done, how something isn't done. And I think a lot of onboarding, and I actually think the reason why corporations can't do that is they often don't even know what their corporate culture is. So they really can't even train them. No one has sat down and figured out how they do get things done so they can't even explain it. That's my theory. What do you think when you've talked to companies? Well, you know, I often have managers say to me, hey, you're talking about the Marines, but when somebody doesn't follow orders, you know, you can make them drop and do 20 push-ups in the sand. (laughs) Right. And and the truth is that does help a lot. Right. Uh, (laughs) Uh, Or, you know, you can make them clean the latrine. Right. Right. And and that helps a lot, too. Um, But but, but I think your point about culture is, is a very savvy point because I always tell my clients, you 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 have a corporate culture, whether you know it or not. Right. The, the question is, do you have a culture by design or do you have a culture by default? Mm. And if you if you don't have a culture by design, then you have a culture by default. And so many organizations, you know, whatever you think of them, Enterprise Rent a Car is a great example of a company that has a great culture. They know who they by are by design. Uh, by design. Yeah, Chick-fil-A, whatever you think about their politics, they have a phenomenal company with a great culture. Uh, they know exactly who they are, and, and, and everyone who works there knows exactly who they are and what they're supposed to be doing. So, you know, I, I, I cite them as an example uh, for that reason. And there's lots of examples of organizations that, yeah, they don't really know who they are, like you right. said. And so it, what I tell managers is if, if you're hiring people, and your company has a culture by default, then maybe just on your team, create a culture by design. Mm. So everyone knows, you know, this is sort of like in school. Yeah. When, when some, you know, some of the teachers are very lax and, right. you know, but then there's that teacher who's really right. strict. Grades hard. And yeah. every, right. And then everyone knows, man, you better show up on time to that class. Right. You better do your homework. Uh, you, you, you can't miss class. If you miss class, you want to get the notes from someone, right. you know, and, and, and who remembers the weak teacher? No, one. right. But you remember that teacher who held you to a high standard. Right. And, and I think it's true of leaders as well. Nobody needs a weak leader. Right. And, and, and remember the millennials, you know, they've had closer relationships with their parents, teachers, and counselors than any generation in history. Right. They love they love grownups. Right. right? <laughs> they love grownups. Yeah. And, um, and and so I always tell uh, my clients, you know, tap into that. Uh, why would you want to be a weak leader? Be a strong leader. Right. And and that starts during the recruiting process. But but where you really where the where the, the rubber hits the road is during the onboarding process. Right. Day one, grab a hold of them. And 
don't ever let them go. Right. This is what we do. Here's how things work. Here's what I expect in terms of when you arrive and when you leave. Like, and and one of the things that I was thinking about when you were talking about the negotiation, you know, from when I when I actually put my corporate hat, it's like, well, then there's inequities that are established. Like, why does that person get to bring the dog in that group, and why does that other person doesn't get to bring the dog? Why does that person get Fridays off and I don't? I mean, how do you deal with those kinds of things as a manager? Because then all of a sudden you have these customized scenarios in every different group that you're in, depending on the manager, and the managers are going to vary. How do you deal with those kinds of things from a corporate standpoint? Yeah, well, I mean, the way most managers deal with it is, you know, they they have to yield to the market pressure because Mm -hmm. you've got somebody who's really good, Mm -hmm. right? You know, if, if, if you've got somebody who's really good and saying, hey, I can't work on Thursdays, and if you say, oh, hey, if I did that for you, I'd have to do that for everyone. Right. Right. And, and then the person's sitting there thinking, really? Are you a communist? Why would you do it for everyone? But then the person so, who I don't do it with, it's like, why is why is it that, you know, James gets to go on, doesn't get to have him come on Friday and I have to? Right. Well, well what, what a lot of managers do because they don't want to deal with that. Right. So what they do instead is they say, all right, listen. Mary, you're so great. You don't have to work on Thursdays, but don't tell him. Oh, yeah, that's even worse. Yeah. Right? They make make the secret deal. Right. So Thursday comes along, and people are like, have you seen Mary? And the manager, oh, nope. Right? (laughs) Mary never comes in on Thursday. I don't get it. (laughs) Right, right, right. And that's when you finally get the, you know, I understand that Mary doesn't have to work on Thursdays, and that's not fair. Right. And then as a manager... You want to sit that person down and say, let me tell you why Mary doesn't have to work on Thursday. Because she does more work than you. Right. You know, she shows up early. She stays late. She bends over backwards and jumps through. She dots her eyes and crosses her T's. That's why she doesn't have to work on Thursdays. Tell me what you want. Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays. You want to bring your dog to work, you weirdo? Tell me what you want. Because there's a few <laughs> things I need from you. Right? And that's what I tell managers. You know, you should right. put a bill the parking lot mary right. doesn't have to work on thursdays come to my office to find out why right you know and look you can't do everything for everybody um and and and, and there are reasons why you may not distinguish between and among employees uh, and you must not and you should not and you'll get in big trouble and you should get in big trouble right if you discriminate against people on the basis of uh, protected classification but the reason you may always discriminate is performance Mm. You you may, you must, in my opinion, you must discriminate on the basis of performance because that's the only way that's fair. Mm. Because as a manager, mm-hmm. right, you have three options. You do less for everyone, and that's what a lot of managers do less for everyone. You know, I can't, if I did that for you, I'd have to do that for everyone, so I'm not going to do it for any. Right. Right. Some managers try to do everything for everyone, and those managers, you know, either they go out of business or they go out of business. Right. Right. Um, there's only one other logical possibility, which is you do more for some and less for others. And explain to the other ones why you can't do more based on performance, right? Right. To my mind, you know, the only fair way to do that is based on performance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So these are some, so these are, and they all tie together, right? It's not the onboarding is important. And the onboarding is even the word choice is a problem, right? Because it's like, you're on board. Once you're on board, we drop you. (laughs) You're on the voyage and we don't give a crap about you afterwards. So it's more like ongoing, continuous improvement. You know, that would be even just even the word choice, I think, is a problem in our in the way that we think about um, bringing on new people. It's like actually being like working with new people forever, like and ma- making them go through progressions just like the military. That's kind of like a aha for me. And it's and what's so stupid, it sounds like common sense. Like when I'm a parent, I have to do a little bit more when I have a baby, an infant, and then I do different when they're a toddler and I do different things when they're a teenager, right? And it's and it's going to be a continuous thing. Is that what people find? Like if people who decide to hold the hands, you know, of these Marines or whomever or whoever initiates a program like that, is there a point where like, okay, do I really have to change your diapers? You've been here for ten years. <laughs> Why? Right. What happens? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, so my advice is to leaders, you should be strong and highly engaged. You should be a coaching style manager, a teaching style manager. You spell out expectations every step of the way, monitor, measure, and document performance every step of the way, track performance in writing, 
you know, have a regular ongoing structured dialogue. But of course, you know, nobody as a leader uh, or as an employee wants to have that conversation six times a day. Mm -hmm. Right. So you start out, uh, you know, doing it a lot. And the goal is you want to help people grow and develop and take on more and more responsibility. And that means they have more and more autonomy. So I always tell in our career seminars that we do. So I do a seminar called It's Okay to Manage Your Boss. Right. And, and what I tell millennials is you want more autonomy? Demonstrate mastery and responsibility. Mm -hmm. When you demonstrate mastery and responsibility, you get more breathing room. Mm -hmm. I promise you what every manager wants is to be more hands off. Right. What every manager wants is to have self-starting high performers who come into the manager and say, here's my plan, and then come back at the end of the week and say, I did all these things and 17 other things and put bells and whistles on all of them. Right. So, so as a leader, what you want to do is train your people uh, to uh, spell out their own plans and, and track their own performance. And anyone who's a self-starting high performer, you know, if your manager says about you, oh, you know, she doesn't even need a manager. You know, the secret that all high performers know is, of course, I need a manager. It's just I'm doing a lot of the managing for you. Oh, right. right? right. So, you, you know, if your manager thinks you don't need a manager, it's because, you know, as an employee, you're doing a lot of that work. Right. And and you're checking your plan with your manager. And if your manager says, no, no, not like that, you go back and then you bring it back. How about like this? Now. The, the problem is that you know, most people need to learn how to do that. And as a leader, what you should be doing is uh, through highly engaged management, you want to also be teaching people how to get better at managing themselves. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was just talking to a millennial who's doing this with her boss. And she said, my boss, and there are some people I know through coaching, they don't think in plans. So if I went and said, here's my plan, here's what I'm planning on doing, this boss would just go, they go blank. No, like null set, you know, they, nothing happens. They don't get it because they don't think in terms of plans and organization. So they, he literally, she's given him several plans and he doesn't respond because he doesn't, he's in the moment in terms of what he needs. Um, right. What would you do in well, a case like that? My, my advice to that manager is be very nice to her because she's going to be your boss in a couple of years. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because if you don't, thinking plans you probably shouldn't be in charge yeah well this gentleman doesn't and he's so good at the relationship part that he's in his job is being valued in the relationship that he's been able to stay in that position i assume for longer than he maybe should but there's these are the kind of yeah. you know so i i think that that works i mean i would imagine that the, the thing that you talked about would happen what would work for 90 percent of the time but there's always these like five percent outliers like this gal who's manager does not think in terms of plans so but I, th I think it's a really good idea and in the book um, we've been talking to Bruce Tilgan and we've been talking about not everyone gets a trophy in the latter chapters you talk about everything a millennial can do right if they can't attend your workshop because they're not in New Haven or wherever they could at least read this and go okay I have a manager that seems like I don't know they, they can't manage me so how can I manage them to manage me like that's really yeah. the attitude you have to adopt right well, well, the Not Everyone Gets a Trophy book is really for the managers of millennials. It's mm -hmm. how to manage them. But but the, then I, I wrote a book called It's Okay to Manage Your Boss for the Millennial. Oh, uh, so all it's right. It's a different book. But, but, but same, same. And in fact, the advice I give to managers in that book, as you know, is, you know, um, in the middle of the book, I start with, you know, teach them how to manage themselves uh, and then uh, teach them how to be managed by you right. right so every every manager is different every manager has their own style so it, it's going to be so much easier to manage young people if you teach them how to manage themselves 